Hi, and welcome back to the series covering financial planning and business owners. I'm Jason Watt. We're going to, in this video, which is number six in the series, look at the question of control of a business. And this should be easy, but it's not always so simple. Now, why do we care? Well, as mentioned, when we looked at Canadian controlled private corporations in the fifth video in the series, if we have 50% um, control, and it's 50% or more. So if you have 300 votes, 150 votes would be enough to uh, constitute control. So 50% control by non-residents makes you no longer eligible for CCP, CCPC status, which as we saw in the last video means then you're also not a small business corporation, which means no access to the small business deduction and no access to the lifetime capital gains exemption. So either 50% control by non-residents or 50% control by public companies will wreck your CCPC status. Now there are two types of control and this is a little bit messy and this is actually something that we've seen in the courts recently and in legislation recently. And the two types of control are uh, de jure control and de facto control. And we'll look at these a little bit more in a couple of slides. De jure control means that you have control on paper, that you have in name at least control over the company, but de facto control means who actually exercises that control. And we generally don't care about this, but there are some tax reasons why this becomes quite important. The test for control for this purpose relies on de facto control, who actually has the right to exercise control over the company in order to get to that CCPC status. And there's a bunch of other related concepts that we're going to work through in the next few videos. So just for the sake of simplicity here, Alan, Bruce, and Connie are three founders. They're all residents of Canada. We don't have a concern then around non-resident control. Now, we don't have a control problem only if we have US um, citizenship. So if it happens to be that one of Alan, Bruce, or Connie is uh, the accidental American we see so much of, or even if one of them has immigrated here from the United States, no problem. We don't have a control issue. You can be a US person, although there can be other complications associated with having a US person as a shareholder in your business it can create some complications with the US tax authorities, for example, but that's not an issue that we'll deal with right now. Um, it can also be a problem if any one of, or sorry, what is not a problem, I apologize, is if any one of Alan, Bruce, or Connie relocate to the US or elsewhere, if it's only one of them, they're each 33% owners, that's less than 50%, we're okay, we still have a CCPC. But where we get some potential problems here is if two of them, that would be 66%, 66 is more than 50, and that would uh, wreck our CCPC status. Or if we have 50% or more of Trashco acquired by a US company, or if 50% or more of Trashco is acquired by a public company, these things would all constitute a problem. And we should be thinking about this as a potential issue that is, let's say that uh, Bruce is planning to one day sell his shares of Trashco and use the lifetime capital gains exemption, but uh, Alan and Connie uh, sell their shares to a US person or a US publicly traded company, or they retire to the United States. Well, Bruce's financial plan now is potentially wrecked and he may not have access to that lifetime capital gains exemption that he was planning to use. I had mentioned that we would come back to the concepts of de jure and de facto control. This has nothing to do with trash co. This is an unrelated scenario, but this is a very common scenario 
that we see where there's this uh, question of the jury or de facto control. So I have a dentist here and our dentist has incorporated Dentist Co. And the dentist as the professional has to be the owner of Dentist Co. This person clearly exercises control, deals with the business. There's probably no doubt that de facto and de jury control both reside with the dentists. No issues there. But now we have another company that's still sort of operating under the same roof as Dentist Co. This is where all the dental hygienists who work with the dentist operate out of. So this company really exists to employ those dental hygienists. And you see this sometimes with the real estate company that uh, houses the dental premises, or you sometimes see this with the hygienists, and that's what we have here. And this company is owned by the spouse of the dentist. The dentist though really is the one who exercises control. The spouse has no involvement, just is a shareholder. This is a classic example where de facto control would reside with the dentist and de jury control will reside with the spouse. We're going to see later on that this is problematic with respect to the small business deduction. Okay, I hope this is helpful in understanding control of a business. It is a very complicated legal concept in real life, and you do find these scenarios where people try to manipulate their outcomes through a variety of methods. If it's anything more complicated than really what I've shown here, then this is where we need to go back to uh, some good tax and legal advice. Even then, even a, in a simple scenario, we do want to make sure that control is properly understood. I hope that helps. Uh, please do uh, join us for the next video in the series. Hi, and welcome back to the video series covering uh, financial planning for business owners. I'm Jason Watt. Uh, we're just gonna take a moment in this video to uh, pay some bills here. Uh, again, I'll remind you that uh, this video series is presented by uh, businesscareercollege.com where I am uh, an instructor and we offer a variety of programs. Uh, the Life License Qualification Program, the uh, core curriculum for the CFP and continuing education and then uh, CHS, CLU and Elder Planning Counselor. And I do want to uh, remind everybody again of my earlier thanks. Uh, it was the impetus of uh, Jim Sullivan from Investors Group in Atlantic Region uh, out in uh, Prince Edward Island who got this whole thing uh, started for us. So again, thanks very much, Jim. Uh, we are now on the seventh video of the series covering the unanimous shareholders agreement. And this is really the lawyer's gig. This is not something, in my opinion, that the financial advisor should be um, should be writing or drafting or whatever the case is. Although later on, way down the road, when we look at uh, buy sells, way, way later on, I am going to show you that there are some good opportunities here for the financial advisor who understands buy sells. We're gonna see this when we get to videos uh, 28 to 30, 32 and 33, assuming the numbering stays the same. And there is some value here in really understanding what goes into a buy sell and understanding the USA a little bit at least will help you to be able to deal with the lawyer when it comes time to talk about uh, buy sell. So as much as this is the lawyer's gig, it is a place where the uh, financial advisor, the estate planner can have some good uh, input. Now, before we get into the USA, I just want to establish, this is a lawyer's word, constating documents. Uh, and constating documents, think of this like constitution, pretty similar sounds. These are the documents that start an entity. These are the documents that, that create the entity. We have articles of incorporation. The articles of incorporation define the share structures. They say, this is how the business is set up. This is where you'd see the class A, class B stuff that we talked about earlier. Now, as I mentioned in that video, we can further uh, refine those definitions in the unanimous shareholders agreement, but the articles of incorporation will at least give us the basics in terms of our share structures. 
Our bylaws define the purpose of the corporation. These are generally very simple documents in for-profit corporations. Um, you'll seldom see overly prescriptive or restrictive uh, corporate bylaws. Lawyers tend to advise business owners to be very uh, general with their bylaws. And uh, these are the two documents that we really need. These are the documents that give all the power to the board of directors. And we saw earlier that the shareholders really only have the ability to vote the board in. It can be uh, important to preserve shareholder rights. And we'll see this on the next slide. So here's my scenario. The shareholders, the problem they have is that means they can be held um, sort of hostage at the whim of a vote of the board of directors. So the shareholders are potentially subject to whatever whims the board of directors have. This can be dangerous for minority shareholders. So it could be that if uh, Bruce and Allen have a falling out with Connie here, we don't know where this leads and not that they can get rid of Connie as a shareholder, but they can certainly remove her influence in the corporation. They can fire her from her role. She potentially is at risk if she's just subject to the uh, to what the board of directors says. And there's actually a, a very uh, famous example of this. Um, it's a, a movie, but the uh, if you watch the Facebook movie, The Social Network, uh, you'll see exactly this thing happen where you have a shareholder whose rights weren't protected via a unanimous shareholders agreement and that person or that that uh, that party, the, the uh, Winklevoss twins ended up getting sort of uh, removed unceremoniously from having any influence in a corporation that they uh, seemingly had some role anyways in creating. This is a, a concern for Connie and she should be concerned about this. And she, not like she's thinking Bruce and Alan might be up to something, but she wants to make sure that if relationships change later on, or if the perception of value changes that she's not voted out and Bruce and Allen should have the same concerns. Now the unanimous shareholders agreement, when it's set up, it's unanimous, the three shareholders or any shareholders have to sign on to it, but then it captures any shareholders who become shareholders later on. So the USA is set up, it needs that unanimous agreement of all shareholders. Pretty easy if you have three shareholders. When you have hundreds of shareholders, it's not so easy. For this reason, you'll see publicly traded companies not have USAs because they have way too many shareholders to make it practical to do this. And publicly traded companies really do rely on the board of directors to make those decisions. The difference being there that you're less likely to have one group of people who really exercises a significant amount of control because of the wider ownership that you see in a publicly traded company. What do we normally see in the USA then? Well, in order to protect the rights of our shareholders, you're normally going to have limits on the sale or transfer of shares to third parties. So it will be the case that uh, not necessarily can Alan sell his shares to whomever he wishes, or not necessarily can Connie sell her shares to whomever she wishes, that you would have to have the consent of all three. And normally that extends to things like uh, Bruce wouldn't be able to sell his shares to Bonnie, his uh, spouse, or Connie wouldn't be able to move her shares into a holding company without the consent of the other shareholders. And then what is often key for the financial advisor here is the buy-sell provisions that we see in the unanimous shareholders agreement. What should happen here is we should cover these what-if scenarios. What if there's a, a disagreement that we can't resolve amongst the members of the group? Okay, and I that is somebody who would have shares of the corporation who is then participating in the Section 85 rollover. The whole idea here is it allows us to incorporate an existing business that may not already be incorporated without creating a tax burden on the taxpayer. The government, of course, wants this because corporations are perpetual entities, which makes them perpetual taxpayers 
which makes them uh, better business operators than sole proprietors. Sole proprietor dies, their business dies. This is not the case with a corporation. Now, what does happen here is when we make a transfer into the corporation, the taxpayer would elect the transfer price and that's either going to create a full rollover or as we'll see, we can possibly create a taxable gain, but generally when we're using section 85 in this uh, format, we're not going to want to create a taxable gain. Now, the advisor in this case is going to have a relatively small role. I would suggest that generally uh, James's role here, our advisor, is really just to make sure that the intentions of the shareholders of Trashco are met. Uh, Norman and Melissa are going to do the vast majority of the work here. The Section 85 filings are going to be done by usually the lawyer, but it might be done by the tax accountant. They will coordinate that. And really, this is a fairly routine transaction. There's not going to be a huge amount of billings on this kind of thing. It's going to be a normal part of starting a business. So it, it really, it has to be done. And it's not a very complex thing from the perspective of either the tax accountant or the corporate lawyer. They will both be very familiar with everything that has to happen here, assuming they're at all qualified. In uh, any Section 85 rollover, one of the things that we have to do is choose a transfer price. Now, you'll see this is not going to be a huge deal. It's going to actually be fairly simple in the trash co example, but we do have to cover off some of the fundamentals here around Section 85. So when you transfer property into your corporation, it's done on a rollover basis and assuming that we're dealing with depreciable assets, which is going to be the most common thing, that will be the, the typical transaction here, is we're taking a depreciable asset and we're rolling it into uh, Trash Co. We'll see that momentarily. That would be the case with almost anybody who is starting a business where they've already been running the business, sorry, starting a corporation, where they've already been running the business as a sole proprietor, and now they're moving that, they're moving their business assets into their corp. That'll be true for uh, a plumber who is moving their plumbing van and plumbing tools into their corporation. That will be true for a financial advisor who is moving their uh, block of business into a corporation. It will really be true in the vast majority of circumstances where there's any sort of property being used in the business that we're going to move from personal ownership or sole proprietor ownership into corporate ownership. Almost always, we just want a true rollover here where we're going to roll that asset then into the corporation at its undepreciated capital cost. And if you need to review undepreciated capital cost, there is an earlier video in this series that deals with UCC. If the fair market value is higher than elected transfer price, then you can transfer the property in and choose to transfer at fair market value. Honestly, there's hardly ever a circumstance where anybody's going to want to do this. The problem here is that's a fully taxable uh, outcome and there's really not a lot of ways to offset that tax. One possible exception here, and I don't think this would be typical, would be if you happen to be doing this in a year when you have very little income from any other source, and essentially you can maybe use your basic personal exemption to move this property in at virtually no tax cost, but still bump up the tax base for the corporation. If the fair market value is less than the elected transfer price, then a transfer would normally result in a terminal loss, but the superficial loss rules would prevent you from being able to use any sort of terminal loss in a non-arm's length transaction. Basically, you can forget about triggering losses in a transaction like this. What will be less common, but will happen sometimes, is we have a business owner who is currently unincorporated and has some land that helps to form part of the value of their business. Uh, farmers will be far and away the most common example of this, where the farmer is currently unincorporated and now wants to incorporate. Well, if we have this, 
we can have the taxpayer either roll that property into their corporation at fair market value or at adjusted cost base. You're allowed to choose either of those values. You're generally going to choose uh, fair market value and just have a straight rollover. Sorry, I apologize. Choose ACB and just have a straight rollover. In many cases, though, the fair market value might be in excess of the ACB. That would be fairly common. And if that's the case, then it can actually make sense to potentially transfer the property in at the higher value, triggering some gains. This might be useful if we have a taxpayer who has unused capital losses. They could then use those capital losses to offset the capital gain that would happen here. And this is now a capital gain. We wanna be clear, this is a capital gain, not an income gain, because it's not depreciable property. We could have some charitable contributions to use, which we could have done on the last slide too. I just don't see that as often as a reason to trigger um, income gains, but it's often used as a reason to trigger capital gains. Might be that you have access to the lifetime capital gains exemption, which of course can be used on a transfer of farming property, including farmland. And again, as I mentioned on the last slide, you might be doing this in a year when there was little other income, and it might make sense to do this just because you can get a low tax cost for a step up to ACB this way. Uh, we absolutely have to be bringing our accountant into these transactions. This is beyond a must. This is just this is it. There's no way to do this without the accountant. And the accountant should be warning us here, especially if you're using lifetime capital gains exemption, about the possibility of triggering the alternative minimum tax. Now, some people don't mind having alternative minimum tax triggered. It's not so much that AMT is something you don't want to pay as it is that AMT is something that you should be aware of a pos uh, possibility responsibility to pay, but AMT is usually not that bad, and especially in a case like this, because AMT is recoverable against your income tax payable over the following seven years. If you're incorporating a business, I'm hoping you're doing it because you're expecting to have at least some tax payable over that following seven years. Now, how's this going to work for Allen and Trashco? Well, Allen is the only one who's coming into Trashco who's actually bringing some sort of tangible asset into the business. And not to say that assets have to be tangible. You can have intangible assets as well that would fall under Section 85. For example, a customer list could be rolled in under Section 85. But we have um, Allen's garbage truck and Allen's garbage truck Remember, he acquired it for $110,000. That's the adjusted cost base. Market value is now $50,000, and it's been depreciated down to $40,000. So Allen's depreciated this thing a little bit more than what the actual uh, value is. So let's have a look at how this is going to work. First off, we know he's going to use Section 85. So he will transfer the garbage truck into Trash Co. using Section 85. One, he won't even probably know this. Again, this is all handled by the lawyer and the tax accountant. So we're gonna do this Section 85 rollover. Now, technically, when he does this, he has to choose an elected transfer price. And the elected transfer price in this instance could be as high as $110,000 you wouldn't likely do that, but we could go all the way up to the ACB, or it could be as low as $40,000. And at $40,000, because that's the tax cost, the UCC, here you would have a true rollover. Anything over that would create a taxable gain. Any price that he chooses in excess of $40,000 would create a taxable gain. We can see this, that if he sold this thing today for fair market value, if he just went and sold it on the market for $50,000, the fair market value, the difference between that $50,000 fair market value and that $40,000 of depreciation, that would be a $10,000 
recapture of depreciation. And Alan probably doesn't want to trigger that. There's really no benefit to him creating that recapture of depreciation. So he's going to do things in such a way that this will not happen. We will not have the recapture of depreciation because he's just going to choose the $40,000 rollover, which means then that Alan is going to take back property that is worth $50,000. We know he's going to take back property worth $50,000, but it will only have a tax cost of $40,000. That's that elected transfer price. So we know then that Alan has to get back um, that property. And what he will most likely do, this is probably what's going to work best given our desired outcome for um, Trashco, is he'll take back one share. That meets the Section 85 requirements and this share will have a nominal value and this might this will be our class A share. So nice and easy, Alan takes back one share, class A. Hi, and welcome back to the Business Career College video series dealing with financial planning for business owners. In this, which will be the ninth video in the series, we're going to talk about related and associated corporations. In the 10th video, we'll come back and talk about affiliated and connected corporations. Now things are going to get a little bit busier here than what we've seen. We're going to introduce some complexity here and I hope that's okay. I hope we're still able to follow along. This is a summary of where we're at right now. Uh, last time we were together, we took Alan through the founding uh, or the uh, transfer, the rollover of his uh, uh, garbage truck into Trash Co. And so now we have Alan who owns 100 Class A shares and Bruce who owns 100 Class A shares and Connie owns 100 Class A shares. Those are the controlling shares of Trash Co. Um, each having a value of $100 and a nominal ACB, $100 each. Uh, Alan also has some other shares that he had to take back in exchange for his uh, garbage truck. So he has some non-voting Class C shares with a redemption value of $10,000 and an ACB of zero. And the reason those shares have no ACB is because he essentially took the ACB that was created when he put the garbage truck in and added that on to that uh, non-interest bearing promissory note that he took out that was issued by Trash Co. So Alan is owed $40,000 of tax paid money or $50,000 in total by Trash Co. Um, representing the value of the garbage truck. Bruce did bring contacts with him, but he didn't bring a formal customer list or anything like that. So we haven't ascribed any value to Bruce's intangibles that he's brought into the business. And Connie brought expertise with her, but again, that's something that we can't really ascribe value to here. So we kind of have Alan with a little bit of a uh, more significant interest, but everybody has kept their voting the same. This would be very typical. Now, that doesn't really have anything to do with the next chunk here, but it was worth, I felt, just having a review of where we're at as far as ownership. We have to look then at what a related corporation is. So related corporation, the word actually is useful, related here. Related means related in the same sense that we talk about people being related. So I am related to my children or to my parents or to my siblings or to my spouse. Well, corporations have that same thing. If you have a corporation that's controlled by your spouse, then your corporation and your spouse's corporation would be related. Or if you control two different corporations, those are also related corporations. Now, this doesn't matter that much in most circumstances. It would be surprising if you had a planning issue come up where related corporations became an issue. 
Um, one example is when related corporations transfer property between them, that that property transfer has to happen at fair market value, or you'll have double taxation, just the same way as when two people who deal, deal with each other not at arm's length interact, then you have that risk of double taxation if they don't sell property to one another at fair market value. Uh, there's a little bit of a benefit here potentially uh, where you can possibly have uh, the lifetime capital gains exemption available where you have the non-owner operator spouse who owns the real estate that the owner operator's spouse is resident on, it's possible that you might be able to use the lifetime capital gains exemption on the disposition of that real estate asset, which might otherwise be considered passive, but because the lifetime capital gains exemption considers an active asset based on its use by related companies, you might get a little bit of opportunity to use lifetime capital gains exemption here that you would not otherwise have. Obviously, this requires good professional tax advice. And also, uh, corporations consider the income of related corporations in determining the eligibility or in determining whether they're a large business or not. This is a pretty complicated idea, but uh, basically, what happens here is if you have income over, and we're going to see this. Uh, when we look at the small business deduction, but if you have income in excess of around well, of $10 million, sorry, uh, then you no longer are a small business. Well, if I own, uh, let's say, four corporations that have $4 million each of revenue, they're not all small businesses, they would all be lumped together and they would be considered a large business. I would not have access to the small business deduction in any of those businesses. And also, I would possibly be subject to a different type of tax that we don't see in small business, a capital tax that large corporations pay on accumulated capital. Now we can see a little bit of an example here. So you may recall that Bruce is married to Bonnie, and if you don't, here she is, Bonnie married to Bruce. And uh, Bruce owns 33% of, of Trashco, that's easy enough. Uh, Bonnie is the sole shareholder of Auction Co. She happens to be in the business of auctioning off equipment. And if it should happen that Auction Co, even if Bonnie and Bruce aren't aware of this, if it should happen that Auction Co sells some piece of industrial equipment to Trash Co at less than fair market value. Now in an auction, fair market value is determined a little bit differently, but let's say that this happens, then we could actually have one of these double taxation examples in which uh, Trash Co would then have an ACB based on the price paid but Auction Co. would be taxed on disposition of that property has been sold for fair market value. Now this gets into all kinds of other complexity, probably not something that our uh, financial advisor, James, is too concerned about. Maybe a little bit of a twist on the accounting side and something we would want to talk to tax professionals about if Trash Co. and Auction Co. are doing any sort of business together, but not something to focus too much on. What we are concerned with and should be concerned with is the associated corporations rule. So the association corporation, associated corporations rule, sorry, might uh, remind you of something we talked about way back in video six when we talked about control, and that was that issue of de jure and de facto control. Two corporations are considered to be associated if one controls the other or the same group of people control both corporations. And there's all kinds of rules around this, but this rule is very broad today and deliberately very broad. Uh, why this matters is because the small business deduction must be shared between all associated corporations. And now something that's changed as of 2018 is that the passive income reduction applies against all uh, associated corporations. So lots of planning issues here. Let's have a look at this in practice. 
we have uh, Connie here and uh, Connie. Connie has two different business interests and you'll see I've uh, rolled the accountant right into this right from start. So Connie is the 33% owner of Trashco, but also Connie, remember she's got a little bit of an entrepreneurial bent. She's got this MBA background. And while she was in university, she designed and built a waste management app. And she incorporated APCO. So APCO owns the copyrights and generates the revenues on this waste management app. And as a result, it continues to generate $80,000 a year of net business income. Good for Connie, right? Well, there are one of two outcomes here and we're definitely going to need our tax professional. If Connie is using the small business deduction, oh, I have an error there, sorry. If Connie is using the small business deduction, then Trashco is going to have its small business deduction reduced by the $80,000 that Connie is using here. So. Now we're only going to have $420,000 of small business deduction instead of the normal $520,000 that we're accustomed to. So Trashco would have its access to the small business deduction reduced, or if Trashco uses all of the small business deduction, then Connie wouldn't be able to use it in APCO. Or it's possible, and this is a really complicated area, again, to determine whether or not the income of APCO is active or passive, but if it's passive income, and from here on, we're going to assume it's not, but just for 30 seconds here, let's say that it is. If it's passive income, then Trashco's small business deduction is reduced by all the passive income of APCO in excess of $50,000, this would be true whether or not Trashco had passive income or whether an associated corporation had passive income. Effectively, if this is passive income, then we lose out on some access to the small business deduction. The math is all up on the board here, but you can see that Trashco would have lost $150,000 of its small business deduction. It would only have $350,000 of small business deduction available. You can see that there are some significant planning concerns around associated corporations. And if any of Alan or Bruce or Connie has other business interests, then we do want to make sure that we've properly addressed those and that we're not uh, souring some of Trashco's tax planning via the activities of those associated corporations. I hope this helps. It's a pretty complicated concept, but uh, it does require uh, an eye on things from uh, James, our financial advisor, and definitely a strong degree of input here from Norman, our tax accountant. Thank you very much, and uh, please continue to join us for this video series. Hi, and welcome back to the Business Career College video series dealing with financial planning for business owners. We are now on the 10th video in the series. We're going to talk about affiliated and connected corporations. If you have forgotten the concepts we talked about in depreciation in the third video of the series, it's probably a good idea to go back and watch that video. There's a reason that we did that video early. It's so foundational to so much of what we talk about here. An affiliated corporation or affiliated corporations are corporations that are controlled by the same group of persons or the same person or by the spouse of that person. Of course, this looks very much like related corporations from the last video, and there is some overlap here, but there are two distinct definitions. Affiliated corporations ties to control. And this matters because of the inability to use certain losses in certain scenarios where corporations are affiliated to one another. This is probably something that the planner is not going to be uh, significantly involved in, probably just that the planner warns the client that they might be in an affiliated situation and makes sure that the planner discusses that with their accountant. Let's see this on the next slide. In my example here, we have Bruce, Bruce, of course, you'll remember is one of the founders of Trashco. And let's say Trashco has a dump truck and this dump truck has been depreciated 
down to $110,000, but has a fair market value of only $90,000. Well, we know based on our review of depreciation that if Trash Co sold that dump truck today, there would be a $20,000 terminal loss. If the dump truck were sold to an arm's length party, to somebody who's not affiliated to Trash Co. And that terminal loss, of course, would then create a tax deduction. Now, let's say that Trash Co sold the dump truck to Auction Co. And Auction Co, you'll remember, uh, has Bruce's spouse, Bonnie, as one of the shareholders. And because of this, these are probably affiliated corporations. And given that they're affiliated corporations, that probably means if Trashco sells this dump truck to Auction Co, that Trashco can't use the terminal loss. Now, there's the possibility that that loss might be added to Auction Co's tax base. That is very much a question, as is pretty much everything here for Norman, whom you will recall is the accountant in this mix. Again, just a little bit of a yellow flag for the financial planner. This might be something where you want to make sure your client is talking to their accountant, that the accountant understands all the relationships in play. Connected corporations, this is a far more common concept. This is one that you probably will be involved in periodically as the uh, financial planner. This is when we have one corporation owning 10% or more of the shares of another corporation. This would be most common in a hold co op co relationship. We'll see this on the next slide. We're going to talk about hold co's quite a bit later in the video series, though. So, this matters because it allows already taxed amounts to essentially move up the corporate ladder. These are the credits that we associate with our corporate tax bill, all things we're going to see as we work through the videos in this series, but this would be refundable dividend tax on hand credits, capital dividend account credits, eligible dividends and non-eligible dividends. Basically, they retain their character as they move up the ladder. So let's have a look at how this would work. We have two different setups here, although I'm going to overlap the setups in a minute here, but in my left-hand scenario, uh, what's happened here is, now we're not actually doing this yet. So for the purpose of this illustration, we're going to pretend that Connie has put a holding company in place. Connie Co sitting here is a holding company where Connie owns her shares of Trash Co. So we have the same basic ownership setup that we previously had. but now we add ConnieCo as a holding company for TrashCo here. So essentially we have Alan and Bruce owning their shares directly and ConnieCo in this notional scenario, at least notional for the time being, owning her shares indirectly through her holding company. We would end up with something like this and Connie owning 100% here. And because this 33% is at least 10%, 33 is more than 10, I think we can all agree on that. And because that 33% is at least 10%, that means that when Trash Co pays any sort of dividend, and this is what I talked about on the last slide momentarily, any sort of dividend is just tax free. As long as it represents after tax amounts for Trash Co, the rules here are a little bit complicated now. There's a fairly uh, con uh, convoluted set of rules here called the safe income rules. And uh, for the safe income rules, again, we're going to need uh, Norman to interpret those for us. But the idea here is that we can pull income up this sort of corporate ladder and it not, it's not really taxed until it gets into Connie's hands. So for the sake of argument, if Trash Co then earns a non, sorry, earns a non-eligible dividend, and it pays that dividend 
out equally to all three of its shareholders, that non-eligible dividend would get distributed to Allen and Bruce. They would be taxed as if they just earned that dividend out of Trashco, as we would expect. It would go into Connie Co and it would be held there until such time, and it could be years later, as Connie decides to take it out, when she ultimately takes it out or retain its character as a non-eligible dividend, because that's how it was originally taxed for uh, Trash Co. I hope that makes sense. That's what we're allowed to do because it's a connected corporation. In a different scenario, again, way down the road here, but let's say at some point Trashco has a bunch of extra cash on hand and no, oppor no opportunity to deploy it in the short term. It needs some long-term investment returns. It figures better to sit on this cash within the corporation than to distribute it out to the shareholders. And so Trashco goes and buys a bunch of shares of investors group management. Uh, let's say for the sake of argument that we end up with $500,000 of shares here. This would represent far less than 10% of IGM, and IGM being a big publicly traded company, and because it represents less than 10% of investors group management, these are not connected corporations. IGM is connected to a bunch of other corporations in that power corp family tree, but IGM by itself sorry, IGM related to Trashco is not a connected corporation. And now as IGM pays dividends out to Trashco, so now there's dividends and let's say for the sake of argument, we have a $20,000 dividend paid out here. Well, that's that dividend is taxable to Trashco. We'll talk more about the tax consequences of that dividend in a later video but that dividend is taxable to Trash Co. It's not allowed to be paid up tax-free up the corporate ladder because Trash Co is not connected to IGM or IGM is not connected to Trash Co. And therefore, Trash Co is taxed on that. Now there's a little bit more to that, which we'll deal with later on, but recognize that ultimately when the dividend is paid to Alan, Bruce, or Connie, it still will retain its original eligible dividend characteristics. This is what we would call an eligible dividend. And that eligible dividend remains eligible when we pay it out to our three original founders or whoever the shareholders of Trashco happen to be. I know that's a little bit of a complicated concept, but the connected corporations rule is quite important. That's what establishes that flow between our operating company and our holding company. As long as we have that minimum 10% relationship, that means we can essentially pull amounts up the corporate ladder and they retain their original tax-free character. It becomes a little bit more complicated, as you can see, when you are not uh, connected corporations. I hope that's helpful and I hope you're able to make that connection for the clients that you deal with and how they own subsidiary corporations or how they own subsidiary shares in their corporations. Uh, please enjoy your continued learning. Thank you very much. and welcome back to the Business Career College video series dealing with financial planning for business owners. In this video, we're going to launch into a fairly lengthy discussion covering dividends. This will be uh, basically the introductory video covering from video 11 that we're currently on up to uh, video 18. And there will be relevance to everything we talk about in this video as we work our way through the rest of the video series. Okay, what is a dividend? So a dividend is a share of the after-tax profits of a corporation. It's then paid to shareholders. There are two types of dividends or two types of shares generally that uh, result in dividends being paid. Common shares would be the dividend or the shares that the shareholders own normally as a result of being the 
founders of the corporation and then people who buy those shares from those founding shareholders. The vast majority of shares that you would find a Canadian investor holding, and we would also see this with our group of three founders of Trashco, would be common shares. And those common shares have dividends that are paid then only at the discretion of the board of directors. There is some uh, variation possible there, but that's basically how that works. Preferred shares, on the other hand, have fixed dividends and they're paid uh, with precedence over any common shares. The preferred shareholders are preferred shareholders because their dividend rights are preferred over those of the common shareholders. Again, in general, there are four types of dividends. Eligible dividends are paid by a Canadian corporation out of amounts taxed at the corporate general tax rate. We'll see that a little bit more on the next slide and then in some detail in video number 12 in the series. And non-eligible dividends are paid by a Canadian corporation out of amounts taxed at the small business rate. That's going to show up in video 13 of the series. And again, a little bit on the next slide. Foreign dividends paid by any corporation not resident in Canada. There's no tax advantage to these foreign dividends. If I personally own shares of, let's say, General Electric, which is an American company, and I receive dividend income as a result, there's no particular tax benefit to those dividends. It's taxed like any other source of income would be. Uh, capital dividends which are only available in a narrow set of circumstances, we'll talk about these in video 17 and 18, can be paid tax-free by a small business resident in Canada with access to the CDA account credit. Again, we'll talk about that in videos 17 and 18. You generally can't count on capital dividends that are related to sort of windfall circumstances. Now, let's assume that uh, we're dealing with Trash Co. Some years down the road, we have it uh, resident in Nova Scotia and it's earning active income. So just for the sake of argument, to keep this uh, relatively straightforward, we're going to assume that Trash Co. has income for this year, sorry, revenues, revenues this year, total sales, and we'll give it two and a half million dollars and then it has deductible expenses of $1,800,000. So that means it's going to have to pay tax on $700,000 of income. And assuming again, this is all active, what happens here is we divide that out. And that first $500,000 of income is taxed at the small business rate. Now that assumes that Trash Co has full access to the small business rate. We saw in some earlier videos why it might not, but for the sake of argument here, we'll give it full access to the small business rate. That's $500,000. It's taxed at 12%. That is $60,000 of tax to pay. And that means that out of that first pool, that small business pool, there's $440,000 net of tax remaining. Now that's what we would refer to as the low rate income pool or the LRIP, although hardly anybody ever calls it the LRIP, usually just low rate income pool, if anything at all. And that's the amount that's available then to pay as a non-eligible dividend. The board of directors of Trash Co could decide to pay that full $440,000 all out in the current year as non-eligible dividends, or they might pay out $110,000 this year and $110,000 next year and so forth, or they might pay out $100,000 this year and two forty dollars next year and $100,000 the year after that, or whatever the case is, it's really a pool that's available and it's always going to be a sort of fluctuating balance depending on how much is earned by Trash Co and how much is paid out when the board of directors decides to pay it out. And then on the amount over $500,000, quick bit of math here tells me that's $200,000. 
And that's going to be taxed at 31%, which you can see over on the left side. And by the way, I've used 2019 tax rates here. I'm recording this video in 2018, but we're already more than halfway through 2018, and we know there are some tax changes coming in 2019. So I've used uh, 2019 tax rates just to keep the video current a little bit longer. So that's uh, $62,000 of tax. And that means that we would have on that general rate side, on the corporate general rate side, 200,000 of tax, knock off $62,000. There would be $138,000 uh, net of tax. And that's in what we call the general rate income pool or the GRIP. You'll hear people refer to GRIP all the time. It's very common to talk about your GRIP dividends or something like that. And this is available then to pay as eligible dividends. Now we're going to delve into this more when we go through the next couple of slides, but the important thing to recognize here is that these LRIP dividends were taxed at a low tax rate and therefore they're going to be subject to a little bit more uh, tax than a GRIP dividend would be. But lower rates than other personal income. Whereas my GRIP dividends, these will be taxed at rates uh, lower than other sources of income, really the only thing that's going to be better in terms of taxable income is capital gains tax, and that depends to some extent as well on your marginal tax rate. So the important thing to recognize here is that when you have income, active income, and we'll distinguish active and passive income in a later set of videos, but when you have active income over $500,000, you're taxed at these two tax brackets, if it were less than $500,000, then it would just be taxed at the lower 12% tax bracket, assuming that there's not something else robbing Trash Co of some access to that low rate income pool or that small business pool of taxation. There are some principles then. What's supposed to happen, and I mentioned this on the last slide, is that the total amount of tax payable with whatever source of income should net out the same. When we take into account either salary and personal tax rates or dividends and the combination of corporate and personal tax rates, then we should end up with the same amount of tax payable. There should be no substantive difference between the decision to take salary and the decision to take dividends as far as the total amount of tax paid. And I've given a quick example here. We're going to work through a far more detailed set of examples, but this is about right. Let's say I have a taxpayer, business owner, and this person lands at about a 40% tax bracket. That would represent about $100,000 of salary in many provinces. And you take that 100,000, it's fully deductible to the corporation. So that's exactly the amount of salary that's paid, we knock off 40%, you'd have $60,000 of net personal income. Whereas if you said, no, no, I'll leave that in the corporation and I'll take it as a dividend, then you would be uh, taxed still at a 40% marginal tax rate, same thing. The difference now is that there's $100,000 of corporate pre-tax income that would be taxed at, let's say 12%, that's a fairly typical small business tax rate. That leaves $88,000 sitting in the corporation that can be paid as a dividend. The board of directors says, yeah, pay the $88,000 out. And you're normally going to see a tax rate on dividends, at least for higher earners like this, that's about 75 to 80% the rate of salary. So I've chosen 32% here as the effective tax rate. You can pick on this accordingly, but that's about representative take that $88,000, knock off 32% tax, 
and you've got about $59,840 of net personal income. Again, we're going to see a more detailed example of that in the next couple of videos, but that is very much how this works. There is really, at almost all tax brackets in almost all provinces, not going to be a huge difference between the amount of tax you pay in total if you take dividends or if you take salary. This is very close to reality, again, in almost all provinces at almost all tax brackets. And we'll do the math for that, as I mentioned in the next two videos. That being said, why even bother taking dividends if you know you're going to be taxed the same way on either side? Well, the biggest advantage that most people will point to with dividends is that it means you don't have to pay into Canada Pension Plan. Now, it might actually be unwise to not pay into Canada Pension Plan, but as of 2018, and I've used 2018 figures here, that's about $5,200 in Canada Pension Plan premium that you're saving yourself. If you're using that to do something wise with your money, if you're saving for the future, buying disability insurance, that type of thing, really doing something better than what would happen with it if it went to Canada Pension Plan, then you're going to be probably better off. That amount is going to increase. This is going to, I would suggest, augment the argument for taking dividends versus salary because the government of Canada starting in 2019 is engaging in a robust enhancement to the Canada Pension Plan, and that's going to increase the cost for our uh, business owner to just under $7,000, about $6,900 a year, not adjusted for inflation. That's all in 2018 dollars by 2025. So there's a fair bit of savings potentially there for the dividend only strategy. And the other advantage to dividends is, of course, that they can be paid to shareholders who are not employees of the business. There are some downsides to taking dividends. It's tougher to borrow money. Things like qualifying for a mortgage are more challenging. Not impossible, but more challenging. Ditto for disability insurance. It can be awkward for disability insurance underwriting and for disability insurance claims if you don't have some regular salary type of income and it doesn't create any RRSP room, you would have to choose some alternate saving strategy that doesn't use the RRSP or any of the other registered savings plans. And then there are some things that would have to be discussed on a case by case basis. And this is very much case by case, very difficult to come to a set of hard and fast rules here. But if you're collecting old age security or guaranteed income supplement, if you're looking for grants and bonds from the registered education or registered disability savings plan, or if you're looking for the Canada Child Benefit, then I believe in every scenario, it's actually worth it to calculate for that particular business owner, whether it's best to take salary or dividends. And part of what has to be considered here is that the dividend tax credit is not a deduction. It doesn't reduce your net income. It only reduces your overall tax burden. And all of those programs that I just mentioned are based on net income. So you can actually end up hurting yourself a little bit by taking a salary rather, sorry, by taking dividends rather than salary because of the way the gross up mechanism works. But every situation is unique. And I believe every situation does, as I mentioned already, warrant its own calculation here. I do not believe there is one hard and fast rule at all for determining who takes dividends and who takes salary. But you do have to take into account many different factors in order to get to the right decision. And in many cases, it will be the accountant who's actually made a recommendation that the client is probably going to stick with and short of uh, challenging the accountant, you are probably going to find that your client is just going to do what the accountant tells them. You may want to give the accountant a call and chat about why a particular decision was made, but I would suggest this is a tough thing for the financial planner to influence meaningfully if there's already been advice given by the accountant. 
Okay, uh, that video ran a little bit long, I do apologize, but we covered off the basics of dividends there and really uh, set a foundation for the next set of videos that will follow dealing with eligible and non-eligible dividends and then moving on to capital dividends, capital dividend count credits. Uh, please enjoy your continued studies, thank you.